I will begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for these students again, Lord. And just pray you be with us to help us to understand a little bit more about uh, integration today, Lord. You know my pray. Amen. All right, an example. Um, so here I'm going to look at the integral of e to the i a z dz over z squared plus 1. And the reason I'm going to look at this integral is this should, should give insight into what? Things like the integral of, oh, I don't know, cosine of ax over x squared plus 1, things like that. All right. Because um, if we look at this on the region we were talking about last time, right, like d sub r, well, the boundary of dr, I guess I called it. If we look at that on the boundary of dr, then, and I'll remind you, this is dr, right? So we've got our r. We've got our minus r over here. Um, so I guess a point up here, gamma, would be, oh, I guess I use z. z would be equal to uh, what r e to the i theta, for what it's worth. So if we, if we look at the integral of uh, e to the i a z over z squared plus 1 over the boundary of this, this region d, d sub r, then it stands to reason that the integral along the, the real axis here is going to pick up terms like cosine. See, because down here, what do we have? We've got z equals to x, right? So e to the i a z actually equals what? e to the i a x, also known as cosine of a x plus i sine of a x, right? So if I study this complex integral, it's going to give me insight into corresponding real integrals of the form cosine or sine over x squared plus 1. And I can study that complex integral pretty easily because we can use residue theorem and pretty much the same argument we went through last time. Why is that? Well, if you look at the modulus of e to the i a z over z squared plus 1, what do you got? Well, that's equal to one <laughs> this, right? Because e to the i a z is unimodular. It's got modulus 1. And so that's, of course, less than or equal to 1 over the modulus of z squared minus 1, absolute value, which, of course, is going to be less than or equal to 1 over r squared minus 1 for r greater than 1, right? Okay, so just let me not take too long on this one. Let's just kind of carve our way through it. We have the integral over the, the boundary of dr of e to the i a z dz over z squared plus 1. Now, let's, that should be 2 pi i times the residue of e to the i a z over z squared plus 1 at where? What's the, what's the singularity of the e to the i a z is entire, so we only got to worry about this z squared plus 1, which has got yeah, i, and there's also this pesky minus i down here, although it's not pesky to us because it's, you know, not even in there, right? So we just, yeah, we need to look at the residue at i. This looks like a job for rule 3. So we're looking at 2 pi i times, how's it go, e to the i a i divided by 2 times 2 times i. So here I'm, I'm looking at f of z naught over g prime of z naught, I believe was the rule, right? That's the residue of f of z over g of z, given what about, z, what, given what about g? Yeah, yeah, right. So if that's got a simple zero, 
g has a simple zero, then the residue of f of z over g of z is just f of z naught over g prime of z naught. And so what does that work out to? The i's be canceling, the two's be canceling, you got yourself a pi e to the minus a, right? Yeah. Is he real? Because you say that he's the I A Z that was like that one consistency to indicate that this is three No assumption that W is real. I don't think. Yeah, I don't want to believe my argument either because in some sense I feel like you can always factor i out. So like wouldn't that say that e to the z always has modulus 1? Yeah, I know that's false. Um, but yet what's wrong with my argument? Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. The problem is, is this is w conjugate. When I conjugate e to the i w, I've got e to the minus i w conjugate. That's the error of my ways. So I don't get e to the 0, I get e to the i times w minus w conjugate, which, which, which of course will be 0 in the case that w is real. But otherwise, um, not, not so much. Although, oh wait a minute, actually there you go. So it's not so simple. No, I'm still bothered because, oh man, dang, damn it. All right, fine, let's, nuts, e to the i, z. I'll work it out, let me see what goes on here. I do think we want, I think the a is supposed to be a real parameter here that much, I think is the case. Um, well, anyway, let's assume that. So then this would be e to the i a x e to the i i squared a y, right? So this is, I, I think you're right, Sam. I just, I'm, I'm still being seduced by the uh, arguments I'm giving in the red there. And I, I think they're wrong. I just don't know quite why. Because I, I, I see clearly from this that that's, you know, cosine of ax plus i sine of ax, which of course is a, um, you know, that, that has length one, and then we got e to the minus, now, now, we're, now we're manifestly real things, I can't trick myself in anything there, I don't think. What's that? Yeah, we need, we need a is positive, yeah. Thank you, uh, so this would be less than or equal to, well this is just straight up equal to e to the minus a times the imaginary part of z is what we just proved over there. Um, and that will be less than or equal to 1 provided that, so to go from here to here, we just need that the imaginary part of z is positive and um, that a is what? Um, positive. If we have those two things, we're looking at e to the minus a real quantity, which of course we know the graph of that looks like this, so it's largest here, right? Yeah. 
fair enough. I do need to know that A is positive and, um, but then I think we're okay on the, the half circle at least. That's where I'm thinking about. Okay, so, right, well, let's continue on. Hopefully I won't do anything else so uh, sketchy. <laughs> uh, now, so we have pi e to the minus a equals to the integral um, along CR plus of e to the iaz dz over z squared plus 1 plus the integral from minus r to r of e to the i a x dx over x squared plus 1, right? Everyone agree? So there, um, that's the integral over the, the line segment. I just went ahead and wrote the parameterization out. And then this is, of course, for r greater than 1. So let r go to infinity and find that pi e to the minus a is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of um, the integral from minus r to r of e to the i a x dx over x squared plus 1 since the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral over cr plus of e to the i a z dz over z squared plus 1 is less than or equal to pi r times what? Times 1 over r squared minus 1 limited, well, I'm missing a limit I suppose. So then what's this? Well then this, of course, we can break up into the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Well, the, the real part of that's cosine of ax dx over x squared plus 1 plus i times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine of ax dx over x squared plus 1. And, I mean, to be fair, you know, until I've given further evidence, it's really the principal value, right? Because I, otherwise I don't know for sure that the, um, the real and, the, the, the net positive and negative part of the infinite integral separately converge, right? If I also know that, then I can erase the principal values and say equality here, right? Can you guys think of an argument that would support the integral of cosine and sine over x squared plus 1, that integral converging? How about this? Yeah. Where does the I go from the I -A? Still in the marker. So it's easy to see that we could compare the integral of sine or cosine over x squared plus 1 to the 1 over x squared plus 1 integral, right? Because I'm, I'm making the denominator larger, the numerator larger than, than cosine, right? Cosine is at most 1, and I can make the same argument for sine. Sine is at most 1. So 1 over x squared plus 1, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of that converges, right? You could prove that just using, like, direct calculation with inverse tangent if you like. Um, but that, that works out to pi. So these separately, oh, excuse me, let I me, mean, more to the point here. This, uh, 
Um, so um, the integral from zero to infinity, both of these separately exist, which then implies that, and you can do the same for the negative part. So anyway, long story short, it's not hard to see that the integral from, you know, zero to, in, well, oh, good grief, minus infinity to infinity of uh, cosine of ax dx over x squared plus 1 is equal to pi e to the minus a, right? And the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine of ax dx over x squared plus 1, now this is not surprising, is equal to what? What's that? Yeah, zero, because there's no imaginary part of there. So any, any questions about this here? So if they were negative, then we could use the lower half here? Ah, very good, yeah. yeah. If, if, if A were negative, we should uh, flip this thing over and yeah, use the lower, the lower disk, yeah. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's right, because we'd get, we'd get the other residue. Um, so we put in minus i instead of i there. Um, yeah, I think we get pi e to the a. Right. Now, there's another way you can look at this. But you could start thinking about like analytically continuing these formulas or something. Another way we could look at these. But I think I should go on because that will, that will distract me significantly. All right, let's move on to section 12.3. Now, I, I said that the homework is due Friday. Would you guys like an extension past break? I think it's, it's what I'm trying to say is if, you, if you're done by Friday, great. If you're not, it's okay. I think it's healthy to be done with that part of the homework by Friday, but I would understand if you didn't quite have some of the last ones done yet. It's just I wanted to make sure that you're not just doing nothing this week, so I said Friday. Bethany's like, I have a test in about 90 minutes. I don't care about anything else until that's done. I understand. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Just turn out, turn in like eight out of ten. Turn eight out of ten. Um, okay, let's, let's let's go on to the next the the, the next uh, next gimmick, if you will. <clears throat> I'm sorry, not gimmick. I mean technique. Technique. Let's see here. Technique is what we call something in math when it's a trick, and we just don't want to call it a trick. Um. <laughs> so uh, here's the deal. If we look at the unit circle, right? And you could do this with other circles, but we'll just do the unit circle because it's particularly nice. Um, then, of course, you got zero here. And what's a nice parameterization of this? How about this? Z equals e to the i theta, right? That's the parameterization of the unit circle. Of course, we know that that's cosine theta plus i sine theta, right? And on the other hand, we know that dz is i e to the i theta d theta here, right? Um, what else can you say? Uh, well, let's see here. So what I'm looking for, what I'm after right now is we want to drive, let me say it this way, we want to solve for sine, cosine, and d theta in terms of z and dz. One of these is just already in our, it's, it's, it's right there, right? What's d theta is what? One over i e to the i theta dz, right? And then what's, what's that? That's 
or right, dz over iz. So there's one, one, one thing down, right? You can use that. Oh, what, what, if we, what if we look at z bar? What's z bar? It's cosine theta minus i sine theta, right? So if you look at z and you look at z bar, what can we do? We got ourselves the cosine theta is one half z plus z bar, and we got ourselves the sine theta is one over two i z minus z bar. But what is z bar here? Ah, right. Z bar is e to the minus i theta which is 1 over e to the i theta, which is 1 over z. So I think we have it. Let's collect our thoughts. What do we, what do we have here? We have a, a, a way of translating cosine theta, sine theta, and d theta in terms of z and dz on the unit circle. So we got, we got our... I'll write them up here again. We got d theta is dz over iz. And what did I say? Cosine theta is 1 half z plus 1 over z. And sine theta is 1 over 2i z minus 1 over z. This is all for z equals to e to the i theta, right? So, let's take it out for a spin and see what happens. I'm going to make up something. This could go badly. Let's see, do d theta over, I don't know, let's try something nuts. Sine theta plus cosine theta. Let's see what happens. Maybe something horrible will happen. I don't know. I just made this up. I could look at my notes and find one that works out all cool and stuff, but let's do something out in the wild, an untamed integral. Let's see what happens. I mean, I think I can do this, actually, with Calc 2 terms. I'm, I'm hoping, and I want to look at the integral from 0 to 2 pi. So I'm pretty sure that that's going to be 0. But let's see if we can see why it's 0 in terms of contour stuff. So I convert this to the integral over the unit circle, right? Uh, counterclockwise. What's my d theta? My d theta is dz over iz. And downstairs, I got myself a 1 over 2i, z plus 1 over z, and then plus 1 half. Oh, yeah, minus, thank you plus 1 over z. All right. And then what you want to do is multiply that iz upstairs down through. See where it goes. Oh, yeah. So when I multiply i times, I get 1 half. And let, me, let, me multi let, me bring, let me bring these two. Let me bring the two upstairs, OK? So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 2. So I don't have halves all over the place. And then I'm just going to multiply the iz through downstairs. And so when I do that, I will get z times z minus 1 over z. And then plus izzy z plus 1 over z. And then Multiplying through, what we got? Looks like we've got 1 plus i times z squared, right? 1 plus i times z squared, and then plus what? Plus i minus 1.
es bueno. Let's factor out the 1 plus i, yeah? And let's make it a, let's make it a 2 over 1 plus i, since there's a 2 there. And we got ourselves a dz over z squared plus i minus 1 over 2. I might as well pull that constant out front of the integral, right? So where is that quadratic in the denominator zero? So this one's pretty easy. You can just say it's z plus or minus the uh, principal square root of i minus 1 over 2, right? What is the principal square root of i minus 1 over 2? Yes, thank you. So what is that, though? I mean, this is 1 over the square root of 2 times um, 1 minus i over the square root of 2, right? So think about that geometrically. That's like this. So that's 1 over root 2 e to the minus i pi over 4. So this is plus or minus e to the minus i pi over 8 over z about do, 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 square root of 2? No, 4th root of 2. Did I? It's possible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I've, I've invented. <laughs> I uh, manufactured an additional square root of 2 somehow. Don't do that, right? Don't make, ex no, don't make up extra square roots of 2. There's no, oh, still doing it. No, I have too few. Because I think that, I think that, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I think 1 minus i over 2 is, you know, the square root. I mean, the, the, this is... <sighs> well, 1, the, the, this, this is that, right? Disagree? Right? I mean, 1 over root 2 is the cosine of pi over 4. Minus 1 over root 2 is the sine of minus pi over 4. Uh, it might have been right over something like pi minus root 2. Oh, I've been sabotaged. Yeah, I think you were actually right over something. Oh, man. What did I have? Now, you, now you've. So it's, it is divided by the 4th root of 2? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, um, well, you know, there's a simple way to check, right? Square it. What do you get? <laughs> yeah.
if we square this, right? What happens when we square the fourth root of two? We get e to the minus pi i over four over the square root of two. And then this, get, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I, yeah, okay. All right, finally. <laughs> so, ay, ay, ay. This was, this should have been easier than it seemed at the moment. I'm going <sighs> to, Curses. So the point is, the integrand has actually a pair of singularities, it looks like. So if we look inside the unit circle, we've got, um, there's one here, and there's one over here too, right? So um, e to the minus i pi over 8 over the fourth root of two. And we call that thing, we call it thing gamma, and then minus gamma is the same up here. I mean, can we call it z-naught like a civilized human being? Minus z-naught's up here, right? Okay, then what? Can I erase the red stuff? Are we okay? All right. Okay, so then what? Uh, well, residue theorem, right? So we've got 2 over 1 plus i times 2 pi i, right? And then residue. We're going to use rule 4, right? Because we've got a simple 0 in the denominator at both of the singularities. So we just differentiate and plug in the, plug in the root, right? So we get one over one over two z at z naught plus one over two z at minus z naught. And I don't need to actually write out what that is. You can see that we get zero. Now is that the right way to do this integral? I think it depends on what your, uh, what your purpose is, right? If your purpose is to explore section 12.3, then this is a good way to do it, right? If your pur purpose is just to do this integral, then this is, this is wrong, what we've done. It's, it's, it's a very foolish way of doing this integral because I'm pretty sure sine plus cosine can be re rewritten as a single. Um, oh, but it's still reciprocal. Ooh. Ooh. Well, I know sine plus cosine is also never zero, so this is actually not an improper integral, but it does give me pause. Huh. Well, anyway, it's zero, so let me move on. <laughs> yeah. Did anybody, can anybody tell me what sine plus cosine is in terms of sine of something or cosine of something? Ah, all right. What's that? Just Google it. I think it comes from the normal sign. Just, uh, just, uh, just, formula, just uh, evaluated at, uh, You tell me to just Google it. I guess crack me up. Um, a more exciting one. I'm, I'm, anyway, it, it might be possible to, uh, if we were really fresh on our trigonometric technology to do this in a real way more simply, right? But that's probably less true of this one. So this is the one I have in the notes, right? And so again, same technique. So you got like dz over iz, and then you got five 
plus 4 over 2i, z minus 1 over z. You multiply the i z through. And since this problem came from a textbook somewhere, written by someone who has time to sit around and think about how to make problems nice, I think this one works out really, really pretty if I remember right. So we get 2z squared, 2z squared um, minus plus 5iz minus 2, which. Um, <laughs> Let's see, how would you factor that? I think the one in the end is a generalized version of this one. Uh-huh. Well, there is, a, uh, there is one with a parameter. The next example, the notes, actually has an arbitrary variable in it. But yeah, the homework, the, hom the problem in your homework is just a, it's, it's, you can solve by the same method. You just have to, you got an A and a B you got to wrestle with, like we were talking earlier, right? But it's the same problem, yeah. Um, so here, the question is, how do you factor 2z squared plus 5iz minus 2? Well, I suggest 2z and z may be possible, right? And look at that as, what's that? Plus, oh, plus i. That would almost work, but then I'd have a minus 1. Oh, 2i two, two over here, right? Then we get, we get 4iz from that. We get iz from that. So we get a total of 5iz. We get the minus 2. Cool. And then this one's easier, actually, to see whether or not there's a singularity, right? So if we look at the unit circle, we've got z2 equal to minus 2i, right? And z, let's say z1, equal to minus i over 2. So the, the minus i over 2 is inside the unit circle, the minus 2i, not the scale, it's outside the unit circle. So the residue theory is a little bit, a little bit prettier here in some sense. We've got 2 pi i, the residue of 1 over 2z squared plus 5iz minus 2 at where? At minus i over 2, which, you know, by rule, I guess we're going to use rule 4 again, right? So we get 1 over twice minus i over 2 plus 5i because I'm differentiating the denominator and then plugging in the root by rule 4, using rule 4, yeah? And then what's that? That's 2 pi i, 2 pi i over... 4i, and so the i's have it, and uh, we got pi over 2, yeah? Question, <laughs> could this integral work out to be imaginary? Oh, I think I did something wrong here. Huh, or there's an error in the notes. Oh. Should that be a 2 times minus i over 2? That should be a 4, right? You're like, learn how to differentiate. Come on. So if that's a 4, that's a 3. So we, have, we get 2 pi over 3, which is a much more exciting answer. Right? And it's very, very much more exciting. There we go. But anyway... Whatever you do here, can you, get, can you get an imaginary answer? I mean, you can, but if you did, it probably, <laughs> it almost certainly means you made a mistake. Because if you're integrating a real function and you somehow get an imaginary uh, value, I would say that that's um, highly suspicious mathematics. Hmm. 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 
you're wondering if there's real, are there real integrals which diverge to imaginary values? I don't know. That's an interesting, uh, interesting question. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, right off the top of my head. Okay, so next we talk about integrands with branch points. All right. So let's get uh, started with one of these. Best way to illustrate is by example here. So integral from zero, to, this is what we're after, integral from zero to infinity of x to the power a over one plus x quantity squared um, dx. Fine print is a is not equal to zero and minus one is less than a is less than one. All right. So sad. Sad, sad, sad. Now this one here, I said what we're going to do is we're going to study f of z equals to z to the a over 1 plus z squared, I think. Which is not, you know, that's kind of kind of straightforward. And, um, well, we're going to use where I mean, that's ambiguous, where z to the a is in particular the exponential of a times the um, logo of uh, z. So that, that, that one has the, the jump, jumps on the positive real axis, right? But on the other hand, uh, f of z is what? f of z is holomorphic on c, what did I call it? Man, I forget my notation. But we got to remove the real axis, right? And also the set containing what? What, what's another trouble spot for z? Yeah, minus one. It's a little bit easier than our first example, right? So we gotta, now on the other hand, at minus one, we just have a, a double pull, right? Looks like we just have a double pull at minus one, so it's not too bad. Um, and so that's, this is where the, the keyhole contour comes into play. We've got to avoid the positive real axis. And we've got to avoid minus one. And so the answer to that is the keyhole contour. Let me draw it. So here we go. Here's the origin. So what we do is we think about encircling the origin with like a little keyhole. And then we go loopity loop like so. The minus one's over here somewhere. That was supposed to be a circle. <laughs> oh well, I try. And um, so in the inside circle we're going to say is gamma sub epsilon and the outside circle here is, I'll call it gamma r. This um, going this way we'll call L plus. Going that way we'll call it L minus. All right. And let's see here, so have I given, oh man, well this picture is, uh, <laughs> this is unfortunate. <laughs> I, I thought 
I, I, I don't know what to do. This diagram, this diagram's throwing me under the bus. Because I've got, I've got an arrow going this way here. I've got another one going that way there. I'm like, what, what, dude? What's that? Yeah, let, let's, let's, for the, um, you know, the uh, grimacing Pac-Man, um, or the keyhole contour, you know, we, we want, so I think we should, yeah, go like that. But that means then, this one's okay. Oh, okay, so then it's, okay, so it's just that one arrow is garbage. All right, now that we got it, so what you're gonna do then is you're gonna integrate f of z dz over, um, you know, call this thing r sub epsilon and, um, well, r is a bad letter. How about d? And it's got two things. It's got an r and an epsilon. So over the boundary of d, depending on r and epsilon, and, and that, that's going to be what? The integral along L plus, plus the integral along L minus, plus the integral along gamma r, plus the integral along gamma epsilon, right? <laughs> Did I just use gamma because it looks like an upside down L? I, 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 um, I'm not sure why. So just to give you, I mean, we, we obviously can't do it. We have you know, like a minute left or whatever. We have zero minutes left, which means we have two minutes left by my time. But um, no, uh, I should behave. So long story short, we're going to look at two limits for these kind of problems. What you're going to do is you're going to shrink the inner circle to zero. And you're going to expand the outer circle to infinity. And then we're going to give ML arguments that will show that this piece goes to zero and that piece goes to zero. And then on the other hand, the L plus and L minus, they're not the same thing because the phase factor is different above and below. You've got theta equals to zero up here. You've got theta equals to two pi down there. And so that distinction in phase gives you a different power function above and below. And so the integral is non-trivial. But anyway, we'll, we'll, work, we'll finish this Friday, of course, but uh, that's, that's the idea of the keyhole contour when you've got, you've got to work around a branch cut. Yeah. Anyway, thanks.